Amen. Well, it's a blessing, as I said, to be able to share. I've had um, a message on my heart um, that has been greatly burdened. Um, I've been greatly burdened with. I would very much normally come with a practical message, um, but I feel God leading me to bring more of a teaching um, today. And we're going to be looking at the question, which covenant? Which covenant? That's the overall theme of this morning and into this afternoon, which covenant? I had the joy of sharing this message. Um, I'm a trustee for Messianic Testimony, and we shared that there um, in... Um, when was it? Back in, in June, so just last month, just over a month ago, um, I shared this message there. I um, want to share it here, and I'm going to be sharing the same series with my home fellowship that I pastor in Wolverhampton um, also. It's that significant, I believe, and that important uh, of a subject. So if you wouldn't mind turning to Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to be quoting from a large amount of scriptures, but also turning to some but if we turn to them all, then each sermon will be about two hours and we'll run over our time. So if you're not able to find them so quickly, then if you've got a pen and paper, I do encourage you to jot down the scripture references that I'm going to quote. And then you can go back and look at them um, yourself in your own time. Galatians chapter 5 and um, verse 1. Might be too loud, maybe. How's that sounding? Sounds all right for us, because um, we haven't got any amplification. There is an echo in it, so just make, make sure that's muted. Yeah, if you can, you can't mute your... Can you mute it at all, sir? Yes, I've muted it, just not because I can. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. If Sally had a laptop, you could um, mute. I don't think you can mute on there. Yeah. Okay, Galatians chapter 5, mm -hmm. and verse 1. We will be picking this back up and looking through it um, as we go on. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. And so, Lord, we come this morning to your word, and we want to ask again, Father, for a touch, Lord. My God, we want to ask that you would help each one of us this morning to lay hold, to comprehend the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of all that will be discussed in this most fundamental of matters this morning, Father, that is integral to the gospel, Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that if anyone here this morning, perhaps, Father, may be in trouble in regards to what we're going to speak of this morning, the new covenant, then I pray, Father, that you would open their eyes I pray, my God, that you would give us a warning this morning, lest, Father, we too might fall into the snare of the evil one, whom, like a serpent, Lord, lies in wait to deceive. Give us grace, Lord. Give us wisdom, Father. Anchor us, Lord. Ground us, Father, that we may be able to stand fast, as Paul here just exhorted the believers, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And so I do pray these things in Jesus' name, for your help and grace now, in his name. Amen. 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 Well, what I'm about to share with you this morning is of great personal endearment to me, because 22 years ago, I stood at a crossroads in my life as an unsaved man being drawn by the Father to his precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I was at that time attending two places of worship, one on a Saturday and the other on a Sunday, one a Seventh-day Adventist church and the other a Pentecostal. Now, if you know anything about the Seventh-day Adventists, you will know and understand the present danger that I stood in. 
Because in reality, I stood at a crossroads of two covenants. Two covenants. I had a choice to make. Moses or Jesus. Now, there are some today that claim that you can serve both. That you can hold Moses in one hand and Jesus Christ in the other. But I want to say unreservedly this morning from the very onset, you cannot. You cannot. I'll never forget the struggle of soul that I passed through in those early years because the burning passion of my heart, the great desire of my soul was for truth. I hadn't yet become born again. I was searching. The Lord was drawing me. And all I wanted was truth. That's it, truth. And if the law was still binding and intact, well, then I'd bind myself to the law. But... If it was not, then I would bind myself to grace. So it wasn't a matter of inconvenience, Shabbat, Sabbath, this law, that law. That was no problem for me. I was prepared to walk through broken glass if that was what, it was, if that was what God required. But if he didn't, then how foolish of me to try to put myself in something that God says was no longer in force. Well, I thank God for the book of Hebrews and for the dear pastor of the Pentecostal church at the time who pointed me to reading it. He didn't engage in debate. He simply asked me, have you read the book of Hebrews? And so around that night or the next few days after I began to read through the book of Hebrews and I thank God that the rest was history. Well, today, God in his providence has allowed me to be part of a ministry called Messianic Testimony. I'm one of the trustees of that ministry. It's a mission to the Jewish people. And the heartbeat of that mission is to see them, the Jewish people, to the Jew first, Romans 1.16, to see them come to faith in their Messiah. And I know that many of you here have a personal love for Israel and a strong desire to see salvation come to the Jewish people. You have a passion for end time prophecy of which Israel, as we know, are at the very center of God's purposes and plans as it relates to the end times. I mean, this very meeting that I've been asked to speak at today is called Israel and Prophecy. Need I say any more? Well, I thank God for this because historically, I don't know if you know much about church history, but anti-Semitism has been the scourge of the Christian church down through the centuries, that the Christians have scorned and done hideous things to the Jewish people in the name of Messiah, in the name of Christ. And alongside this, we've had this teaching called supersessionism, or you may know it as replacement theology. And I thank God that, that this isn't a problem here in such circles, because I know that you love the Jewish people. I know that you, like me, are indebted to them for the privileges that we have come to inherit as Gentiles. And I know that you stand vehemently against every form of anti-Semitism. And that you, like I, can't tolerate and will not tolerate any form of theology which tries to assert that the church has replaced Israel and that as such has become the new beneficiaries of those promises which belong exclusively to them. We don't have a problem with replacement theology, supersessionism here, and nor do we have a place or, or a problem with or nor do, is there place here for anti-Semitism. You remember Paul's words in Romans 11, those famous immortal words, Romans 11 verses 25 and 26, as he ends that great passage. He started in Romans 9, 10, 11, explaining the prophetic purposes and plans and covenant which is still in force that God will make sure with his people Israel. He said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. 
Has God finished with his people Israel? Has God made null and void his covenant with Abraham? God forbid. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I don't have to worry this morning about any of you dear folk having a problem with this. But I want to say that that does not mean that we are without problems. Because I stand this day as a watchman, a watchman to lift my voice in warning against a movement that is fast growing momentum across the evangelical world. I'm sure you may have heard of it. Some call it the Hebrew Roots Movement. Others call it Torah Observant Christianity. Call it what you like. Names change. But the overriding emphasis is the same. They tell us that the Gentile church has been infected with Greek culture and as such needs desperately to return to its Jewish roots from whence it came. And when asked, well, what does this look like? What does this returning back to our Jewish roots look like? One is speedily pointed to Moses and told that in order to be a true follower of Yeshua, Jesus, then you must keep Torah, the law, dietary laws, Sabbath laws, the feasts and festivals. If you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, then you must not do so as a pagan, but as a Torah observant Christian. That's what they tell us. In the last 30 to 40 years have witnessed the rise of messianic movements which have brought with them the good, the bad and the ugly. And alongside the wheat, sadly, has also grown up the tares, the tares, old age heresies which for centuries have laid dormant, have again resurfaced in our day, threatening to beguile to deceive the unsuspecting and entangle them again in a yoke of bondage. You speak of Jewish roots this morning. Well, I want to go back indeed to the roots this morning, back to the first century church, because they were all Jewish initially and that believed in the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, their Messiah, and the Gentiles came in behind them. I want to go back to the first century church because I'm not sure if you're aware, but the very first heretics to ever infiltrate the church were a sect called the Judaizers. You say the who? The Judaizers? What did they believe? Well, we're given what they believe here in the word of God. If you would kindly turn to Acts chapter 15. Because this argument, this matter was settled nearly 2,000 years ago. We have the conclusion of the matter right here in God's authoritative word. Acts chapter 15 and verse 7. Or we'll begin, sorry, in verse 1 and we'll just read down to verse 6 initially. Acts chapter 15 and verse one. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. 
But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, Torah. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Now the church in Antioch, which was where Paul resided with Barnabas, having returned from his first missionary journey, you can read it, there in verse 26 of Acts chapter 14, we see that amongst that congregation, Gentiles were found alongside Jewish believers. The Lord was moving marvelously before Paul went out on that missionary journey. In fact, he was sent out on that journey with Barnabas right there from Antioch in Acts chapter 13. And Gentiles were being saved. Paul had been throughout Galatia and brought back encouragement. The Gentiles are being converted to Jesus. But we see that certain men came down from Judea, zealots for the law. They too believed in Jesus, but they brought another gospel. Not the gospel of grace, but instead they said that unless these believers be circumcised... After the manner of Moses, then there is no salvation for them. They cannot be saved. And so Paul and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders to discuss this matter. Is the law still binding? Is Moses still in effect? Are the Gentiles required indeed to be circumcised? And not just circumcision, but we see here in, um, in verse Five, that they said it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So to keep the whole of the Torah. These Pharisees believed in Jesus, but they added to the gospel works. Well, you'll be pleased to know that this question of whether or not we need to keep the law isn't a matter of my opinion, but the word of God is conclusive on it. The matter was settled nearly 2,000 years ago. The finding of the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem was conclusive. And yet, this same lie is still being perpetrated amongst believers today. That is that repentance and faith, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus is not enough. One must keep the law in addition, the law of Moses. Well, what was the conclusion of this early council? Well, let's pick up the account in verse 7 here. And when there had been much disputing, debate among them, Peter rises up. And he says unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made his choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Of course, he's speaking here of that historical event when Cornelius and his whole house were gloriously saved. And you remember the battle that Peter had, him being a Jew, go down to the house of a Gentile, not on your life. And God had to give him vision while he was in trance and he saw that blanket coming down with unclean animals and the Lord said, eat. And God says, what I have called clean, you're not to call unclean. And so that settled the matter. God said, go. And as Peter began to preach, the Spirit of God came upon that gathering of people, Gentile people, and they were gloriously saved and spoke in tongues as the Spirit came upon them with power. And who could forbid them water, seeing that they received the gift of the Spirit just like us? This is the account that Peter here is referencing. A good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. He put no difference between us and them, Jew and Gentile, purifying their hearts by faith, by faith. Now, therefore, if that's the case, 
Why tempt ye God? Why put him to the test? To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. And the yoke that he's speaking of there is Torah, the law. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. On what grounds? Faith. Faith. As we'll read later on in the book of Galatians. God had wrought great wonders and signs among the Gentiles through the hand of Paul and Barnabas. And after they held their peace, James answers and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And he now brings scripture to back it up. Peter uses anecdotal evidence, as does Paul. James now brings scripture alongside that to verify it and say, Yes, indeed, this is what the prophets foretold. To this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, leave them alone, which from the Gentiles, among the Gentiles, are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Well, a study of the New Testament epistles will readily reveal that this incident in Antioch was not an isolated incident, but in fact the Judaizers were everywhere, infiltrating the church, and Paul has much to say in his letters concerning that, and I'll quote a few passages, not least the book of Galatians, I mean that whole book Galatia was the region that Paul travelled through on his first missionary journey that we've just read about here. Signs and wonders being miraculously done by God, by his spirit, on account of grace. Paul writes the book to the Galatians because the Judaizers were coming in with another gospel and Paul withstood them. We'll learn more about that later on. But what does Paul say? Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through to 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who, who hath bewitched you? Who's charmed you? Who's pulled the wool over your eyes that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus the Messiah has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn if you please tell me. Just answer me this question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Well, we could ask Cornelius the same, and he would, of course, say, by faith. Are you so foolish then, having begun in the Spirit, God gave you the Spirit by faith? Are you now so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you're now trying to finish the job in the flesh, perfecting in the flesh? In Philippians, Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 1 through to 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is needful. It is safe. Beware of dogs. And here he's speaking about the Judaizing sect that sought to mutilate them. He, he uses that language here. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision, the mutilators. It's a play on words. It's being sarcastic. For we are the circumcision who, Paul? We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit 
and rejoice in Messiah Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through to 3. What am I doing here? I'm trying to show you that the problem of the Judaizers was widespread and that the New Testament writers address this matter head on. We've seen in the book of Galatians, we've seen in the book of Philippians, well, we could equally turn to the letter to the Colossians, and Paul deals with it also there. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul says this, Let no man therefore judge you in meat what you eat or in drink in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the substance, is of Christ. The fullness of the shadow has come to completion in Messiah. Let no man judge you in these things. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul, in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy, chapter 1 and verses 5 through to 7, he says this. Now the end of the commandment is charity, that's Old English for love, out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, sincere faith, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain janglings, disputations, vain disputations, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. They're coming and trying to put you under law. They don't know what they're on about. Paul had credentials. Tribe of the Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day. He gives his Credentials in Philippians 3, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, according to the law, blameless. If anyone understood Torah, it was Paul. Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're on about. They're trying to put you under a yoke. Brothers and sisters, the new covenant, the new testament is conclusive. Romans 3 verse 28 Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, put in right standing with Almighty God by faith, without, apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28. If you look, please, at, with me at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm trying to build a biblical case, and I'm going to move on in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. And we will read down to verse 22. Or we'll see how we get on. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles. A Gentile is a non-Jewish person. Someone who is not born Jewish. But is not Jewish. Is a Gentile. Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Messiah, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I mean, that was our condition, bleak and dark. But now in Messiah Jesus, Yeshua, ye who were sometimes far off are made near, nigh, by the blood, the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace who has made both one, the both there speaking of the Jew and the Gentile, in Messiah Two are made one, hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That middle wall of separation was Torah, the law, the law, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And so Jew and Gentile in Messiah now are one in him. We have been made one by a completely different economy to Moses, as we'll see shortly, a work of the spirit of the living God. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh to Jew and Gentile, Gentile and Jew, for through him we both have access, here it is, by one spirit, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, unto the Father. The new creation, one new man. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 7 and um, verse 12, I think, is it? I'll, I'll, I'll check. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 12, I think. Yeah, I'll come back to that. And so through the Spirit we have been made one. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and of the household of God. Fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. Sorry if any man be in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Okay. Okay. So if this is the case, we have to ask the question this morning, well, why then is there any confusion? It hasn't taken me very long to make a pretty airtight case, not from one particular passage, but for a multiplicity of passages to make it clear to you this morning. Well, why then the confusion? How is it that so many believers in our day are being derailed and taken off track? Well, I believe that it has to do with one word, and that word is covenant. Covenant. If you truly understood what this word meant, its significance, its application, both in the Old and the New Testaments, such a question as this, which part of the Old Testament law are we still required to keep? As New Testament believers, such a question like that would be a fallacy. It would be faulty reasoning because it fails to comprehend the critical terms of new and old. I often meet believers, indeed I ask the question as a young believer myself, which parts of the Old Testament are we still required to keep? And by asking such a question, it showed my ignorance of Scripture and my ignorance of the terms Old Testament and New Testament. When we identify ourselves as New Testament believers, which we do, what are we actually saying? Well, the word testament is another word for the word covenant, they're synonymous. We have a title page at the beginning of our Bibles, and it says, the Holy Bible containing the Old and New Testaments. And we think nothing of it, Old and New Testaments, but the word testament actually means covenant. And we could better read that, the Holy Bible containing the Old and New Testaments. Covenants, covenants. So what we're actually saying when we say that we're New Testament 
believers, we're actually saying we're new covenant believers. That's what we're actually saying. That we're believers abiding in, abiding under the new covenant. The new covenant. You know the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25. We have communion every week in our fellowship, in our church. And oftentimes, nearly every Sunday, these words are repeated. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, New Covenant, in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25. Well, the word used for testament here, this is the cup of the New Testament. The word testament there is the word covenant. It's exactly the same Greek word. You can check it out for yourself. Well, that then asks the question or begs the question, what's a covenant? What do we mean by covenant? You see, in 21st century Great Britain, we don't often have to deal with this word. But to the ancient world, this word covenant was very important in all types of contexts, not least in the context of war within um, Gentile nations. Well, biblically, a covenant is a solemn agreement entered into between two or more parties, a solemn agreement entered into a contract that's binding between two or more parties. As I said, it's contractual, it's binding. Oaths are sworn in the presence of God and the whole contract is then enacted or ratified by the shedding of blood. That's important, biblically speaking this is. Well, one such covenant that we're all familiar with is the covenant of marriage. The covenant of marriage. Oaths are sworn for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. And we conclude, there too I give thee my pledge. Oaths are sworn. God Almighty is invoked to bear witness on those oaths that are being exchanged and made. The marriage is then ratified by blood in the consummation of that marriage. The covenant of marriage goes right the way back to the garden. Right the way back. One man, one woman, joined together in wedlock until death doth part. Well, in the same way, there is an old covenant, an Old Testament, and there is a new covenant, a New Testament. The first is ratified in blood, and the second also is ratified in blood. The first ratified at Mount Sinai, the latter ratified at Mount Calvary. Hence, our Old and New Testaments. In Exodus chapter 24, if you turn there, please, this is probably one of the most important passages that we're going to turn to, at least in this morning's teaching. And if we really understand this and grasp it, we'll make a profound impact upon our lives, especially as it relates to this matter of covenant. Exodus chapter 24, please, and verse 3. We have here the account of the children of Israel entering into that first covenant at Mount Sinai, that covenant enacted with blood at the hand of Moses. Exodus 24 and verse 3. This is also alluded to in the book of Hebrews, I believe Hebrews chapter 10. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the law. Listen to this. All the words of the law. All the words of the Lord, sorry. And all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will 
do. That's important. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill, 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt <laughs> offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood. You see, a covenant needs to be ratified with blood, enacted with blood. Here it is. The old covenant was enacted with the blood of animals, bulls and goats. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant. I want you to see that this morning. Not just 10 commandments, tradition has it, 613 commandments. What were these commandments? We'll begin in Exodus, read through to Deuteronomy, and you'll see them all there. They're contained in Torah, the law, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I want you to see he took the book of the covenant, the covenant, very important, and read it in the audience of the people. It would have been a scroll, of course. And they said again, listen, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. They bound themselves to that covenant with nothing less than total obedience to one command, to all that thou hast said. All that's contained in the book of the covenant. Moses says, at your word be it so. He takes the blood, he sprinkles it on the people, he's enacting this covenant, and he said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these things, concerning all these words. You notice here in verse 3 and also in verse 7 what Israel said. Some of what the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient? No. All, all that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. They didn't say some of it. They said all of it. And Moses took the blood of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, and the book of the covenant, sorry, Moses took the book of the covenant he read it in the audience of the people. So if we correctly understand this right, then this is important because those wanting to go back under the law today tell us things like, well, Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial aspects, but the moral aspects are still binding. Shabbat, still binding. Circumcision, still binding. Feasts and festivals, Dietary laws, eating the pork, not on your life, still binding. But hang on a minute, I don't think that the children of Israel had the liberty of picking and choosing. It wasn't that they said, well, I like this little bit here, we'll keep that bit. And that bit over there, well, we won't keep. They bound themselves to the whole lot. And so those wanting to go back under Torah, don't stop at Sabbath now, go the whole hog. Keep the whole book of the covenant, all 613 commandments, is still in force. Is that my words? Well, it's the words of James. James chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all, of all. And we read in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's what Moses said. That's what the children of Israel said agreed to well i don't see any movement today advocating that we need to keep us for one it's impossible it's impossible there's no altar there's no animals in which to offer sacrifice on that altar 
There's no priests. There's no high priest. Well, Jesus is our high priest. We have a sacrifice once offered to sins. That sacrifice which takes away the sins of the world. Thank God for that. And so God has made it such that you couldn't keep the Old Testament law if you wanted to. That is in its entirety. You can chop and change between new and old. But hang on a minute, you can't do that. If you're under the new, you're under the new. If you're under the old, you're under the old. And of course, we see the great curses and the blessings. We'll look at some of those a bit later on in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. What would come upon Israel should they break covenant with God? And so the question that you must answer this morning is simply this. And when the Judaizers come, and they will come, and perhaps even you are sitting on the fence on this matter. The question that you must ask this morning is this, which covenant? Which covenant are you under? Which covenant do you want to be under? You cannot be under both. The writer of Hebrews tells us that the old has passed away by virtue of the coming in of the new. I mean, basic English language. If I say I have an old pair of trainers and I'm replacing them with a new pair of trainers, well, the new supersedes the old. Language is important. Old means old. New means new. So even there in the very names, God couldn't have been clearer. If you look in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7, the prophets foretold the day would come when God would make a new covenant with his people. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7. Hebrews 8 and verse 7. Now I just want to add this in while we're turning there. If you pick up a Tanaka Hebrew scriptures and you try to find a New Testament in it, well, you're not going to find a New Testament in it. But equally, if you try to find an Old Testament, that title page will also be absent because the Jewish people don't recognize Old and New. For them, there's just one covenant, the covenant of Moses, the Tanakh, the Torah, is, is the law. The Tanakh is the Old Testament, as we would call it, scriptures. But they wouldn't recognize such terminologies in old, as old and new. For them, there's just one covenant, Moses. It's us who are believers in Messiah who use the language of old and new because the New Testament does, because of what Jesus has done. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7, we read these words. For if that the first covenant had been flawless or faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But for finding fault with them, that's his people, he says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. This is quoting from Jeremiah 20, um, 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So let's be clear here. God is saying, Jeremiah predicted it. Jeremiah 31, 31 through to 34. God said, I'm making a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's not going to be like the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, that covenant at Sinai. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, in verse 10. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest, 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. That was the point I was making. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Couldn't get more clearer. As New Testament believers this morning, brethren, we've entered into a new covenant. Not the old covenant at Sinai, but the new covenant ratified at Mount Calvary. For this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 28, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is not of works, it is not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and verse 9, It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And of course, in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 17, John 1, 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus, Messiah. Now let me give you a simple analogy. We've all perhaps got mobile phones here, and from time to time we switch providers. If I get a new contract, I know we don't tend to read the contracts. I mean, there's about 1,000, 2,000 words in micro print. Term one, term two, term three, we're not interested. Just tell me how many free minutes I get and how much I need to pay a month. That's generally what we're concerned about. But we're actually binding ourselves into a contract. It might be for 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And whilst under that contract, you're under the terms and conditions of that contract. We don't know necessarily what they all are, but if we bother to read the small point print, we'd see what they are. Now, if I come to the end of that contract and take a new contract out, get a new mobile phone, and then go to the old contract to try to find out what the terms and conditions are, it's not going to help me one little bit. That contract was for the old contract. Those terms and conditions, sorry, for, were for the old contract. I'm under a new contract now, and so I go to the new terms and conditions. Well, similarly, we're under a new contract. We're in a new covenant. Where do we go to to find out the terms and conditions? We go to the new covenant. We go to the New Testament, because there we spelt out how we're to live for Jesus. What God expects of us. We don't go to Leviticus, although, praise God, the Old Testament is full of history that is beneficial and needful. We learn of the character, the righteousness of God. Indeed, the new covenant comes out of the old. I understand that. But I don't go to the old terms and conditions to find out how to live under the new covenant. I go to the new terms and conditions found in the New Testament. It's a very simple way of looking at it, but very, very important. And many, many believers struggle with this matter. Well, can I still eat pork? Well, where are you looking? Um, Leviticus. Well, how about you look in the epistles? Let's look in the New Testament. What does it say there? Ah, you know, and there we have our answers. It's, it's vitally important. You can't conflate the two as you get confused and you end up in a mess. It's very important. The only law to which we now pledge our allegiance as new covenant believers, we have new one commandment given us by Jesus Christ, John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's our terms and conditions. The great commandment, the chief commandment, the royal law, James puts it, is the royal law of love, that we love one another as Christ has loved us. If I love you, I'm not going to murder you. I'm not going to lust after that which belongs to you. Love covers 
eat the totality of that which we're required to keep. Now, we do find other express instructions and exhortations given to us in the letters. Not to murder, not to fornicate, not to steal, not to lust. All of these I can show you clearly in the New Testament. You'll not find Sabbath in there. Keep Sabbath. That's not found in the New Covenant. That was left behind in the, new, in the Old because the shadow of what it pointed to has found a realisation in Yeshua. We have our rest and peace permanently, not just one day, 24-7, 365, we have peace with our Lord. So we go to the new covenant to find the terms and conditions for the new contract. And I want to warn you this morning, not with my words, but with the words of Paul, that we have to settle this matter which covenant we want to live under because you cannot live under both. If you look in Galatians chapter 5, please, and verse 1, we're going to be coming back to this importantly after our, our break. I have a few scriptures to end with because I want to bring some clarification um, just before I finish. There may be some questions, so I just want to try to anticipate that and bring some clarification. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, well remember this letter was written to the church, to Gentile believers um, who were being enticed to go back under the law by the Judaizers. <clears throat> Paul says in verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty, the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That's strong language. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. That's what we've already seen. Messiah is become of no effect unto you Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Paul's categorically clear that if you want to be circumcised, and he qualifies that, being made justified by the law, seeking to earn merit with God through keeping the Mosaic Covenant. Paul says here, Christ will profit you nothing. You don't need him. Get on with it by yourself. And more than that, he says that Christ will become of no effect. Whoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You've fallen from grace. So, we can't live under two covenants. You cannot pick a mix. You either keep all of one, in which case, if you're under the law, then you don't need Christ. Get on with it. He'll profit you nothing. You cannot appeal to grace. That belongs to the new covenant. You can't appeal to faith. That belongs to the new covenant. If you're under the old, get on working. But it will never justify you. You'll never be saved by keeping the law. Our only hope is salvation which God provides through his Son. Freely given, received by grace, through faith. And God justifies us on the basis of that and the finished work of his Son, period. Well, what then about feasts and Sabbaths, dietary laws? Well, the New Testament leaves this down to personal choice in as much as this. So long as that personal choice and conviction does not become law. That's the important distinction. You keep whatever day you want for the Lord. Keep Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If you want to keep Shabbat, Sabbath on a Saturday, go for it. But be careful. The minute that you attribute merit to that that somehow by doing that, you're earning right standing with God, Paul says that's law, and you can't have law and grace. Choose one or choose the other. And similarly, regarding foods, 
Eat what you want. Refrain from eating what you want. Indulge in what you want. But be careful if you think that by not eating particular foods that somehow God is more pleased with you and you're earning right standing with God, well, then you're under the law and you don't need grace. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. That's the important thing. You are fallen from grace. We'll look at two more passages and we'll be finished. In Romans chapter 14, Paul deals with this from a slightly dis different perspective, um, encompassing Gentiles into this, but also Jews as well, as we'll see. Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. You see, for some people coming out of idolatry, they may have particular hang-ups about certain foods. A Muslim coming out of Islam may have hang-ups with eating halal meat. I know it's meat, we say, but he's, in his mind, no, it's been sacrificed to a God that is no God that he once served, and he just can't be dealing with that. So for personal conscience sake, he'll say, look, I, I can't eat halal, count me out. A Hindu might have a problem with meat if they were vegetarian before. Similarly, the Jewish person coming to faith in the Lord may have particular hang-ups with pork and shellfish, etc. The New Testament allows for that, for those various different convictions, so long as it doesn't become law, and that's the important thing. And so we read in chapter 14 and verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes he may eat all things, another who is weak eats only herbs. Let not him that eats despise him that doesn't eat, and let not him which eats not judge him who eats, for God hath received him. For who are you that judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, yea, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regards it unto God, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he that eats not to the Lord, he does not eat, and give God, gives God thanks. And so, in other words, the kingdom of God in verse 17 is not about meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You don't want to eat particular things, no problem. You want to keep a particular day unto the Lord, keep it, no problem. But don't make it law. The problem in Galatia was simple. They taught, unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. They taught that justification, being put in right standing with God, comes through keeping carnal ordinances. And Paul says, no, you trifle with grace the minute you say that. We're saved by grace alone, in Christ alone. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And that not of works. Well, the last passage that we'll turn to this morning is in Acts chapter 16, because we see an interesting verse here as I finish, in Acts chapter 16, and people are often fond of accusing the Bible of contradiction, and this perhaps is one potential verse that they could use as ammunition. But I want to do a little um, apologetics on this, if you like, and to exegete, to interpret this passage aright. And it's very powerful when we actually see this. If you look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 4, Paul here comes to Derbe and he finds this faithful disciple called Timothy. We're told that Timothy's mom was Jewish. We're told that his dad was a Greek. So he, he was dual heritage, if you like. And in verse 4, as they went through the cities, 
They delivered them the decrees for to keep. Remember, Acts 16 follows directly on the heels of Acts 15. The decrees mentioned here were the letters that they got from the apostles telling the Gentiles that they're not under Moses and all they need to do is abstain from things, from fornication, from things sacrificed to idols and from blood, from things strangled from blood. Well, here they come now delivering those Decrees, telling the Gentiles what they must keep, that were ordained of the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. But if we look a little back and we read, I'll begin at verse 1. Then came he to Derby, to Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, him would Paul have to go forth with him and talk and circumcised him. What? Paul, you've just told us that if any of you try to be circumcised, you've fallen from grace. What are you doing now circumcising Timothy, is this hypocrisy of the first rank? Well, let's understand the context. Circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. It isn't a contradiction at all. Yes, I understand that Paul told us already in Galatians 5 and verse 2, we just read it, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. But we must remember the context. What was Paul doing? He was taking the gospel amongst the Jewish people, as his custom was. He'd go into the synagogues, he would preach Messiah, proving from the prophets that he is indeed the Christ. And when they did not believe and rejected, he'd wash his hands and turn to the Gentiles. Well, if Timothy is going with him, it's going to be a problem and a hindrance to the gospel. If the Jewish people should say, why have you got this uncircumcised Jewish man with you? Remember, his mother was a Jewess, so they would have considered him Jewish. And so that the gospel be not hindered, Paul said, well, fine, be circumcised. Never was he doing it in order that Timothy might be justified before God, but rather he was using his liberty to further the gospel. Noble cause, perfectly fine, Paul. Exactly as Paul goes on to say, unto the Jews I became a Jew, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Paul never for a minute thought that he'd be justified by the law. But what was required to try to win his brethren, he came down to their level. To them that are without the law as without the law equally. Being not without the law to God but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without the law. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some, and this I do for the gospel's sake. I knew a Jewish man who wouldn't eat pork. It wasn't that he had a problem with pork, but he was Jewish. And when sharing the gospel with his kinsmen, if they were to ask him, well, do you eat pork? It would be offensive and it might close the door of opportunity. And so he used his liberty in Christ to abstain from pork that he might win more of his people. That's called love. That's not law. That's not going back under the law as a means of justification. The Judaizers did not say that as I finish. The Judaizers, certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And so I want to exhort you this morning, brothers and sisters, we must know in this perilous hour which covenant we're under. The matter of covenant is of fundamental importance because if we understand that we're under the new, then we're not going to be sucked in by these shenanigans that come down and say, look, you Gentile, you pagan 
Look, get back under the law. Go back to your roots. You're missing something. We can tell them we're not missing anything. We have everything we need in Jesus. We abide under the new covenant. We find our terms and conditions in the new covenant. And the two do not meet. And so, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going on in grace. And so I trust that this has been helpful. I trust that many of you perhaps know this already, but I can't tell you the amount of people that are being sucked in by the seasoned believers, you know, that are being sucked in by this leaven, and it is leaven, you know, that somehow they're looking at, at a Jewish person as being somehow more spiritual and they're somehow giving to them something that we've lost. Friends, we've not lost anything. You know, we have the words of Paul, we have the words of God in this book, and we must hold fast, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and be not entangled again under the yoke of bondage. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Well, Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you, Father, and give you the glory for... For this, Lord, and for what has been shared in this first session, I trust, Lord, that it has been beneficial and helpful. I pray, Lord, that if there are any that perhaps are sitting on the fence entertaining this matter, that clarity has been brought this morning to help them, Father, that they are not deficient, that they are not somehow second-rate believers, but, Lord, they are believers abiding under the new covenant, trusting in Messiah Jesus to save them by grace through faith. And I ask that, Lord, you'll encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.